again early and at it uh, to see Rome. And to see Rome in two days is really a challenge because Rome is a beautiful and vast place with something new on every corner to see. Um, we began our day with a visit to a, a church called St. Peter by the Chains, I believe, which is where the chains that actually bound St. Peter are kept in this open glass kind of uh, box in the front. Beautiful, beautiful church. Um, I think I had never been to this particular church, and I always thought of St. Peter's as the St. Peter's Basilica. So it was really an experience for me. Um, there's also wonderful, wonderful fresco paintings on the walls. Uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous uh, church. Uh, you visualize the, the change of St. Peter's right at the, the front of the church, and to the right is this large, large uh, sculpture that's made by Michelangelo. It's Michelangelo's Moses. And uh, just a fabulous piece of sculpture. And once again, much more massive than you ever see. The picture is uh, similar to the David. You know, you have to be there in person to really get the scope that this, this wonderful artist work. Michelangelo's Moses um, also has another interesting characteristic that um, I was unaware of until we went. And that is uh, the ancient Hebrew text um, cites uh, Moses as having two rays of light uh, pointing down on his head. And in fact, the translation that was kind of misconstrued and that Michelangelo, in fact, did the, the actual sculpture was two horns uh, on the top of Moses' head. Um, I was unaware of that myself. And uh, as it was explained to us, it was, it was fascinating. It was a great way for our, us to start that day because we're going to depart from there and go to the Colosseum and the ruins, uh, which took a good part of our morning and early afternoon. When we got to the Colosseum and saw the very scope, the size of this immense building, and realized how long ago this was created and what it may have taken to architecturally construct this and, and make this, these huge blocks uh, on to, upon each other. Uh, it was, it's so, so daunting. When you get inside and you see the small, the passageways underneath the main floor and realize that they housed live animals that were either brought above to, to fight and to to kill each other, or brought about, brought above to fight humans, um, just for the pure spectacle of it. Um, it just, it's amazing. It's it's something that causes you to step back and to think about what pieces of this are still remnants of our present society. Um, when you, this this uh, wonderful, wonderful stadium is so like so many of our stadiums today except uh, they, don't, they didn't have the modern tools we have to, to create them, and yet it still stands. We got up to the, the deck, I guess, or the, the main area of the Colosseum, and assembled and once, like we did everywhere in Rome, we, uh, we sang, and got quite an audience once again, and, and uh, sang to the many, many people throughout the Colosseum, and it was, a, it was quite an experience singing in this huge uh, Colosseum. Thou found 
exist to uh, let us know what antiquity uh, was like in that part of the, part of the, the city.
chamber where the, the ancient Roman Senate would meet and uh, discuss political matters and those things that uh, concern the, the governing of Rome. Uh, this is a cavernous stone room which you can't really enter, you can only enter into about 10 or 15 feet of it. But as we approached the, the opening of this I realized there was a beautiful acoustical effect could be achieved if you sang into it. So we assembled the choir and actually didn't face out where the people were. We faced into the Senate chamber and sang into the Senate chamber and allowed the reverberance to come back out and, and draw a crowd on the outside. Uh, we followed that by turning and, and facing the crowd and singing another piece to them so they could actually see us. Um, and again, we advertised our evening concert, which at this point had become pretty commonplace. All my jealous ears grew mist, all my joy music from heaven's mist, sent for our joy. She also came and heard, oh my joy, what said she is this word? What is my joy, what is my joy? And I replied, oh see, oh my joy, tis thee I cry, tis thee. is, of all the churches we were in, probably the best restored or preserved at this point. Uh, all the churches we got to perform in. Uh, recently, obviously, regilded, cleaned, and so on, uh, this very, very large basilica stands with some very unique features. First of all, where the, the choir actually stands, there are these enormous, uh, three enormous pictures that are framed on the wall. Uh, they're not frescoes, they actually look like they're canvas pictures, I believe. <clears throat> they are they're framed and above them rises this dome. And this dome, um, I, I can only guess at how high it must be, but unlike the dome at the Duomo, which is a 360 degree dome, this dome is kind of half open and facing forward uh, toward the church. So when you look at the choir, which is evident in our CD that we've made, you can see the, the actual dome above, above this. The sound um, echoes, I think someone counted, it's nine, eight or nine seconds of reverberance. So when we brought the, the choir into this hall to warm up, We'd sing a major scale up and back, and I'd change the key up by a half step. And as we began the second major scale, we'd be dissonant with the first major scale, which was still finishing. Um, it was a unique experience, something I've never had an opportunity to do anywhere else.
the wonderful uh, things in Rome to see, the beautiful sculptures to see, is the Trevi Fountain. The Trevi Fountain are these wonderful sculptures that are a giant fountain in a piazza, and it's very near St. Ignatius. Uh, we were able to go there, it was actually evening, it was all lit by uh, lights all around the fountain. And uh, people say that if you throw a, a coin in the fountain, you will in fact return at some point. So we all took our turns eating gelato and throwing coins in the fountain and appreciating the, the beauty of this as well as how the light would capture them. The next morning we were up early, um, left for the other side of the river where the Vatican is. We were very, very fortunate because it was the first day that in fact people were allowed into the Sistine Chapel since the Pope had been chosen. St. Peter, the Egyptian obelisk, one of the largest ones. The Vatican is a hard place to begin to talk about. Um, it's overwhelming the amount of art that has been accumulated by the Catholic Church in the Vatican. It's amazing that it's been gathered up and put into this fabulous museum for the whole world to see. And I guess in, in a way it's, it's wonderful that at least it's preserved there uh, because it is in, in a place that's very well taken care of very well guarded and, and certainly where people have an opportunity to visit on a regular basis. But the sheer amount of art is breathtaking. Um, the gilded ceilings, the paintings, the frescoes. To, to imagine anyone frescoing an entire room is just beyond my imagination even though I've visited the Vatican twice now. Uh, when you stand in these rooms and realize that Raphael and and Michelangelo, and these wonderful, wonderful artists spent their lives here uh, doing this work. Uh, we hurried through the Vatican. You could take days or maybe weeks to see all that's in the Vatican. Uh, we had such a schedule, we couldn't, we had to keep moving. And we did. Uh, we not only visited the Vatican, but we visited St. Peter's, which, although it appears to be right alongside the Vatican, is quite a walk from where the Vatican actually is. And as we walked out into St. Peter's Square before we went through St. Peter's, we happened to be there before the Pope was going to do his first evening Mass. St. Peter's Square also looked different than I had remembered it because it was set up with thousands and thousands of folding chairs where the Pope's installation was going to be the very next day. Uh, unfortunately, we were going to get on the plane the very next day, one hour after the Pope's installation. What was even more frustrating is that tickets for the installation were free and available right there if we could just stay an extra hour. <laughs> of course, this wasn't possible. We entered St. Peter's. And if you've never been to St. Peter's before, at least I can remember the first time I went to St. Peter's, <clears throat> I didn't believe there could be a basilica as large as this. Um, there's no way for me to talk about the dimension of the size of this, this space. Uh, there are many, many chapels off to the right and to the left and to the rear of this wonderful basilica that house smaller services at various times. At any given time at St. Peter's there can be three or four masses going on at the same time. Uh, the sculpture, the painting, the Pietà, which is just as you enter the, 
the basilica you realize on the right hand side is, yeah. is Michelangelo's Pieta. Yeah. St. Peter's remains are in the grotto, um, actually directly under the dome of, of the basilica. Um, and the amount of guild that is, is on all of the columns and so on. Again, tremendously impressive uh, relative to the wealth that it has taken to create this art and to preserve this art. Our week in Italy began in Venice with us taking part in a, a Catholic service uh, at San Marco. Uh, in that same town, we, we visited the Jewish ghetto, which had tremendous cultural significance. And Venice itself was the home of so many cultures that we began our trip learning and, and hopefully becoming more sensitive to the cultural diversity that so much is represented in Italy. It's fitting that once we got to Rome, uh, we would actually conclude our trip by visiting the Vatican and the Sistine Chapel, which had been closed to everyone until the day we arrived. And further, that we happened to be there on the first day of Passover, and then we'd have our the Seder that evening that was arranged by this, the very students, the Jewish students on the trip. There were a lot of interesting things that happened in planning, planning the Seder, uh, trying to find the materials needed. Uh, we questioned our guide, John Paolo, as to where we could find horseradish, and he didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, we got to the Jewish ghetto in Rome to try to, to find matzah, and found that they had all closed early. And we were able to talk one of them into reopening and selling us fresh matzo, which was which really a treat. Once we were a slave to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord in his goodness and mercy brought us forth from the land with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. We therefore gather year after year to retell this ancient story, for in reality it is not ancient, but eternal in its message and its spirit. It proclaims man's burning desire to preserve liberty and justice for all. Let them go, let them go, let them go, let them go, Amazing. So it all kind of dovetailed. Uh, the, uh, the, the Sayer was wonderful. The students, students each read uh, portions. They, uh, they passed the, the book around and various chaperones read other portions. Uh, students who had never been at a Seder uh, got an opportunity to realize what one is. And it was a fitting way, I think, for us to, to close our, our cultural journey uh, where we reached across all the boundaries of time and culture and diversity and, uh, and learned to appreciate other people's expressions and other people's experiences. Oh.